Hello and welcome to an Ask This Brexit special. Theresa May has finally fired the starting gun on the process of Britain leaving the EU. Well, we've been a member for more than 40 years and although the Prime Minister famously said Brexit means Brexit and no deal is better than a bad deal, we still don't really know what life outside the EU will look like. What will our trade relationship be with our closest neighbours and what's the future for EU citizens living and working here? Well, we'll try to answer some of those questions about Britain's exit from the EU in the next half an hour. With us is our economics editor, Kamal Ahmed. Oliver Eilot, senior researcher at the Think Tank for Institute, Institute for Government, which works to make Whitehall more effective. And the UK immigration lawyer, Natasha Chell, just appearing in vision, partner at Laura Divine Solicitors in London. It'd be great if we could rehearse all this, wouldn't it? Uh, let's make a start then. We'll try and uh, look at all those different aspects that, uh, if we can. Um, the first question, Oliver, we'll start with you. What will happen if there is no deal at the end of two years? We can't agree terms with the other 27 members. Well, if there's no deal at the end of two years, then we're out. That's the process that we've started today. We've started the countdown timer. And if there is no deal, by March 2019, then the way it's drafted in the EU treaties is that our connections to Europe simply cease to apply. And that's problematic because some of those connections support things that we're used to doing here in the UK. And so it's a, it's a scenario that both sides are trying to avoid. But at the same time, Natasha, that all sorts of work will be going on to try to put legislation in place that will be necessary, assuming there is a deal, but working a bit blind because you don't know what that deal is going to look like. Yeah, absolutely. And certainly from an immigration um, perspective, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to secure those rights of European nationals currently in the, in the UK at the moment. Um, and that seems to be a priority for the government, um, not just the European nationals here, but also for, for British citizens in, in, in Europe. Oliver, for a lot of people, leaving the EU is... A, is, is, is the end of many, many years of campaigning. It's what some people have wanted for a very long time. But if once on the outside of the EU, we don't really like it very much and think, hold on, we'd have been better off staying in, will we be able to rejoin? What would that process be like? So technically, yes. So the EU has a very well-established process for joining. They call it accession. And there's nothing in the rules around joining that prohibits you from doing so if you've already been a member. So technically, we could rejoin. I think probably, though, politically, that would be a difficult sell. Um, at the moment, the UK has a sort of bespoke relationship with Europe. You know, we pay a little bit less in as contributions. We aren't members of the euro. And if we were to rejoin, there's a question mark about whether we'd join on exactly the same terms. And as I say, politically, it feels like we're a long way from that. In the yes. Moment. Wouldn't we be encouraged to join the euro if it still exists? Well, I think the, the lesson in Europe is there's always the rules as laid down and then there are the rules as they're interpreted. And since we're probably talking many years into the future. We, it's probably not fair to say at this stage exactly what an accession process for the UK would look like. No, we don't know what's going to happen in two years, never mind longer than that. Uh, Kamal, how is the rest of the EU going to be affected by Brexit then? I mean, Donald Tusk said today that it was not a reason to rejoice either in Brussels or London. Not, a, not at all, Martin. I think there's, a, there's sort of the political shock to this long-term project, which of course was originally built in the ruins of the Second World War to really end conflict in Europe and to support economic growth. And to a large extent, it has been successful um, in that. Um, uh, I think there's been an economic shock. There's a feeling of economic shock um, across uh, Europe. Businesses are worried. Uh, Britain is the second largest economy in the European Union and is an important, was an important uh, player in the European Union. Uh, we were quite reform minded. I think a lot of countries like Germany and Sweden and Poland liked the fact that Britain was in the European Union, a little bit sceptical of the European Union, not the same sort of gung-ho pro-federalist approach of, of, of France, for example. And I think that balance was quite important to the European Union. So I think the fact is that um, the EU feels that it has been negatively affected by Britain saying it wants to leave. But what it has done on the, on the contrary side to that is it has sort of given the EU that notion of we need to pull together now and we will we will deal with Britain as the EU 27, the other 27 nations. And it has given them um, that sort of 
burning platform idea. This is a real existential threat to Europe, therefore we must pull together. And most of the polling has suggested that since Britain announced it was leaving um, the European Union, actually pro-European sentiment has slightly gone up across Europe, interestingly. So although there's the political shock, the economic shock, to some parts of the EU, this could be quite a good sort of gelling factor against uh, uh, further moves towards uh, division. How will the rest of the EU cope then with a 38% drop in its income when we stop contributing? As everybody, many of those who wanted to leave said, we look, we're spending all this money, we could spend that at home. Uh, and of course, usually new countries that come into the EU are net beneficiaries, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, so Britain was a net, is a net contributor mm -hmm. to the European Union and certainly for countries like Germany, who are the biggest contributor to the European Union's budget, that net contribution from Britain was very, very important and I'm sure will be one of the big negotiating areas over the next two years. What does Britain continue to pay into the European Union for access to the single market, for access to the customs uh, union and for access to some of the regulatory bodies that Britain might want to retain and, and may maintain um, uh, operation with. And I think that will be one of the big debates. But yes, the issue is that, that Britain is a net contributor and that is an important part of the European Union um, uh, budget. And I think Germany in particular will be pushing to ensure that there is some kind of deal with Britain, but it, as part of that deal, there is some form of contribution from Britain into the European Union. Or, although, if there isn't, frankly, Germany will be paying more. This probably is to uh, Oliver and Kamal. Uh, it's from M. Cook in Wivenhoe, sent to us via text. We should start making trade deals with Commonwealth countries and also China and South America. If the EU don't like it, what are they going to do? Expel us? <laughs> you know, we're going anyway. Yeah, I think there are probably a few things slightly holding the UK back there. So the first of them is if you're about to launch into the process of doing lots of deals around the world, you want people to think that you're the kind of person who sticks to the deals and contracts that you've already signed. So breaching our arrangements with the EU by running around the world doing trade deals doesn't send the best signal to those people we're trying to do the deals with. But it's also worth reflecting on the fact that many of these countries you know, Brazil, China, India, these fast-growing economies, there's a reason why not many people have trade deals with them already. And it's because it's very difficult to get trade deals with these people. And you can sink a lot of time and resources into that and not get very far. So the EU's been negotiating for Brazil with, for over sort of 20 years now. Uh, talks have been going on with India over and over again, and you don't get anywhere. And finally, I think the last consideration for the UK on this is, at the moment, it has access to over 50 European free trade deals. Now, it won't keep that access automatically. And so where it's focusing its time and resources is in carrying over the deals that it does have, and then it can turn its attention to the new deals that Theresa it wants to do around May's the world. made very clear today, you know, she says, we are a law-abiding country. Mm. The, the regulations and the rules of being a member of the EU is that you cannot do separate free trade deals with other countries. I, mean, I agree absolutely with what Oliver says about the complexity of doing those deals in any case. But I think that it's absolutely right that if we were to try to go beyond what I'm sure are informal behind the scenes talks with many nations about the type of trading relationship we could have with them, to do anything formally and to launch that type of aggressive um, um, position at a time when we are, it sounds like to me today from the letter being quite conciliatory, I think would send a very negative message to the rest of Europe and the rest of Europe would react pretty robustly. There's an, another um, text message. A lot of these are anonymous. People seem to not want to <laughs> tell us who they are. Um, everyone keeps saying the EU will slap a 10% tariff on our goods going into Europe. So why don't we just slap a 10% on uh, coming back the other way? Um, and as we don't import more than we export, won't it cost them more than us? It's a well, bit tit for tat, no, 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 uh, isn't it? It would be a little bit, Martin. I think, I think neither side at this stage wants a tariff war. I don't think that would be seen as being good for either the economy of the UK or the economy of uh, the rest um, of Europe. And though, yes, um, uh, we do um, import more than we export as a proportion 
um, Britain's weight in the Europe is far lower than Europe's weight in Britain. So although on the, on the actual numbers, yes, that is correct, on the actual quantity, the proportion, uh, Britain is less important to Europe than Europe is to Britain in terms of imports and exports. And I don't think either side of this debate over the next two years wants this notion of a battle, of um, a sense of uh, conflict, um, whether it's over tariff barriers, whether it's over non-tariff barriers, rules and regulations. And I think that both sides want to at least start on a good footing. And if we were to approach it like this text um, a question came in, I think that that would soon disperse and I think that would be a real problem for both sides. But, sorry, on sorry just to yeah. jump in on that as well. I think yeah. there's a technical point to be made here about how tariffs work in the world. You know, there are rules that have been set out that we've all signed up to about how tariffs work precisely to limit this kind of trade war. So the World Trade Organization says that if you've got a 10% tariff on cars, like the EU does, then you charge that 10% tariff on cars from all over the world. From India, it's 10%. From Brazil, it's 10%. From Russia, it's 10% from America. You've got to treat everybody the same. And so if there's no deal between the UK and the EU, we're not suddenly going to find the EU slapping 100% tariff on cars, because it's not allowed to. But equally, if there's no deal, it couldn't not put a tariff on us because that wouldn't be treating people the same. So if there's no deal, the 10% tariff on cars is, is where you, the EU is forced to go. It's not a question of starting a trade war. Liam Campbell, who wasn't afraid to tell us his name, um, <laughs> on Twitter sent us a, a, a question. Uh, the, the, this, uh, the, the Prime Minister said that there'll be no Scottish referendum until the Scots know what the Brexit deal will be. Why was that kind of thinking not applied to the EU referendum. In other words, we think we want to leave, but we'll make a real decision when we know what the terms of the deal would be and then we can pull back from it if we don't like it. Well, we're not a country with a rule book when it comes to referendums. So different referendums are set out in different ways. And if you wanted to know why we launched the EU referendum in the way we did, you'd have to ask David Cameron and the MPs in Parliament who voted to start that process. But I would say on the parallel with the Scottish side of things, we went into the EU referendum and voted without knowing what our new relationship with Europe is going to be. The parallel there in Scotland is voting in a Scottish referendum to leave the UK without knowing what your relationship with the UK is going to be. That, I think, is the, is the parallel that you would draw between the two. And also, of course, with this referendum, David Cameron did have a deal of sorts. Of course, you remember him rushing around European capitals saying, I'm going to get some kind of good deal to offer um, the British public. There was some notion of limits on benefits for EU uh, migrants coming here, um, something around red tape. It was relatively limited and wasn't something very... Something around yeah, red tape. Well, <laughs> it, it, was, it was limited and yeah. it wasn't very convincing, frankly. So there was a deal of sorts that was put to the um, British public um, before the referendum. It was a deal on what kind of Britain would remain in the European Union rather than um, uh, what kind of deal would we have if we said we were going to leave. And exactly as Oliver says, uh, the fact is that Scotland wouldn't know what the deal precisely would be with the UK if it voted to leave the UK. Kamal, there's a, another question to do with Scotland here. If the UK has to pay this exit bill of 60 billion euros to the EU, if Scotland were then to leave the Union, the UK, would Westminster, or the rest of what remains of the UK, be able to claim <laughs> yes. some of that money back from Scotland? There would, there would be certainly, if, if Scotland votes to leave the United Kingdom, there would be exactly the same debate about what might be described as the divorce bill. There are huge liabilities shared between uh, the four you know, um, constituent parts of the United Kingdom, whether that's Scotland, England, Northern Ireland or Wales, on things like the operation of government, on pension liabilities, on regulations. I mean, all the same issues that we're now all talking about in detail about the European Union and Britain's relationship with Europe would be exactly the, or would be similar to the ones that would uh, be involved in any debate between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom if Scotland decides to leave. So there would be a debate about the divorce bill. I doubt Britain, uh, I doubt the rest of the UK would try and claw back money that had already been paid to Scotland. But certainly the fact that the UK um, contributes support to 
uh, Scotland under the Barnet formula would become part of the debate about Scotland's exit. Because th that was another thing that, that those who said the union should stay together, that Scotland couldn't afford to sit outside the UK. What would Scotland's economic position be? Well, that's <laughs> hugely disputed. It depends to an extent on the price of oil. Um, that's a huge part of Scotland's um, economy and GDP. Scotland's deficit is certainly substantially higher than the UK overall uh, deficit. Some people suggest that Scotland's economy is weaker in productivity and performance terms than the whole of the UK economy. But Scotland is a highly educated, small nation with resources. It has a pretty developed financial services sector based around Edinburgh and Aberdeen and Dundee. It has good industry, good manufacturing. It has oil. So there's nothing to say economically that Scotland couldn't exist as an independent country. But unwinding itself from the rest of the U United Kingdom would clearly be a very complicated exercise. Let us move on. Thank you for now. And look at some of the immigration issues that clearly are bound up in uh, these deals with uh, Natasha Chell, who is an immigration lawyer. Uh, quite a few questions mm -hmm. of a similar sort coming to us um, in various forms, email and text. What will happen to EU nationals living and working and studying in the UK? Uh, will we need a visa to travel? Will people be kicked out? Well, well, first off, I think I'd like to just reassure European nationals that um, nothing's changed. They have the right to remain in the UK exercise their treaty rights which includes working studying here and many other rights under EU law and that and that will remain the same until we leave those rights however once we leave they will no longer apply under EU law in the UK so those EU nationals will have to seek permission under the UK Immigration Act um, like other currently non-EU nationals have to seek permission to remain here um, whether or not um, the government may seek to carve out something more favourable within the immigration rules for EU nationals, that remains to be seen. And, and I think much of that shall depend on the negotiations with the other member states, because let's not forget we have um, over three million European nationals in, in the UK, but we have nearly over a million British citizens who are living in Europe. So it's important for us to secure their position. Um, so any reciprocal favourable agreement that we can reach, uh, the government would no doubt seek to get that. Does any of it depend on your marital status, for example, or the length of time you've been here? Because Emma on email says, my husband's Italian, he's lived here for 11 years, what's his status living and working here, paying taxes, owning property and married to a British woman? Yes, so um, a European national who um, has resided in the UK for at least five continuous years exercising treaty rights, they acquire permanent residence. They don't need to apply to the Home Office for permission for that, they just acquire it under EU law and so do some of their family members. Um, so if in that, in that case the, the individual that's been here for 11 years, if they have acquired permanent residence then one would hope that they would have something similar maybe in the form of indefinite leave to remain under the current UK immigration rules applied to them and they may be in a more secure position but how the working how this is all going to work out remains to be seen having said that um, the government's very keen to provide some clarity as soon as possible to reassure those European nationals um, what's going to happen on the lead up to Brexit. Sheldon sent us an email, he's asking a question sort of going in the other direction really, saying I have a property in France and want to continue to, to be able to stay there as and when and eventually to live there permanently. Will I be able to do this? Well again, very similarly for, for, for British citizens, they will continue to have the freedom to live and reside in Europe until we, the UK leaves the EU. Um, we would hope that there would be some reciprocal agreements between the UK and the EU and, um, and one would hope that it would be favourable uh, but yes it does remain to be seen because in that scenario they would need to comply with the domestic legislation in that country when we leave. Don't we have any other immigration regulations which are our own, which are not necessarily yes. pertinent just to EU yes, nationals that we might be relevant after we leave to everybody? Well, yes, we do. We have, um, under the UK Immigration Act in 1971, we have immigration rules which enable 
migrants to come to the UK to work, to study, set up business. And yes, of course, the EU nationals, after we leave the, the, the EU, um, you would think could therefore apply um, and be subject to those rules. And absolutely, that could certainly be the case. But it would be quite onerous for them. And because the, the UK economy relies so heavily on EU nationals, one would hope that um, there would be some carve out within the, the immigration rules to provide a more favourable um, uh, uh, routes for those nationals. Another anonymous email. What happens, Oliver, if there is no qualified majority on the exit conditions in two years' time? So could those uh, in the EU, the other, some of the other 27, who love us so much and don't <laughs> want to see us go, could they stop us going? No, the short answer is no. Uh, so we've, we've triggered Article 50, and the way that Article 50 is drafted says you've got two years to get an agreement, and if you don't, you're just out. The, the treaties of the EU simply cease to apply to you. The only way of getting round that at the moment uh, is if the UK and the other EU27 want to keep talks rolling. And then there's a question mark around whether the UK can reverse the process that we haven't, we don't know the answer to yet. But there's no scope, I think, for the EU27 to hold us into the EU against our will. When all of this was being discussed before uh, the vote happened last year, uh, there, were, there were lots of voices saying, um, well, we'd, Article 50 is a very sort of vague thing. It's so <laughs> short and nobody's ever tested it before. I mean, how clear is Article 50 about what it means and what you can do with it and what you can't do with it? Uh, it's certainly not as clear as I think some of us would like it to be at the moment. Um, it is very short. The most uh, contentious bit, and the bit that the UK is probably focusing on the most, is that Article 50 really sets the terms for your divorce. It says the terms under which the UK leaves. And then it says, with playing regard to whatever your future relationship is going to be. And so the focus of Article 50 is really on the divorce. What the UK is much more interested in talking about is what the new relationship is going to be. And that's included in Article 50, but it's not so much the focus. And the challenge for Theresa May, which she has really clearly set her ambition on this, is to try and get the future relationship into the divorce talks and try to have them at the same time. It also talked about it being in line with the constitutional arrangements of the country that wanted to leave. And that's why we ended up going through the Supreme Court to see whether Parliament have much of a role. Is it clear how much of a role Parliament will have now? I think most of the questions about Parliament's involvement have been settled. So Parliament voted to give the government the right to trigger Article 50 and Parliament will have a vote at the end of this process, although you know, if you, we've only got two years to negotiate a deal and if the deal is rushed to Parliament very late in this process, Parliament might have a kind of take it or leave it type option. The wild card in terms of how much involvement Parliament is going to have is how much access they're going to have to these talks as they go on. So David Davis, Brexit Secretary, has said that he wants MPs to have the same level of access to the talks as members of the European Parliament. Now, in the past, members of the European Parliament have had quite a lot of access to negotiating talks. If that's what's replicated in this situation, then that's the kind of wild card in terms of what role MPs might end up playing. Natasha. What's going to happen, says an anonymous person via email again, uh, what will happen to any cases that are going through the European Court of Justice, which lo looks after anything to do with EU law or EU regulation? For example, cases against the UK for not adhering to EU rules. Well, certainly there, there are some cases which um, may arise after negotiations have been settled. Um, and those cases will need to be considered on the legislation which applied at the time so w with regard to the decision that's been challenged so if at that point that case is challenging an, an EU part of legislation then they will have to apply that when considering whether or not it, it, it's right or not. What will happen after we leave then if we've taken a lot of EU regulations in under the Great Repeal Bill um, but we are not part of the EU any longer. Should we have to be under the jurisdiction of the European Court of, of Justice or should we need an, another supranational body which, will, which we would refer cases to which became difficult? I think the key question there is what's the future relationship about in terms of regulation? So we've copied across the EU regulations as they, as they are at the moment but that doesn't mean that if the uh, if Brussels passes new regulations in the future that they'll end up on our statute book. 
that's the key question for the ECJ. If it's going to be the case that new regulations that are made in Brussels are going to apply in the UK, then you can see a role for the ECJ, or I'm afraid there's another of these courts, the EFTA court, to have a role in interpreting these things. But if actually we're going to strike a trade deal where the UK is going to have more independence in terms of setting its own regulation, then you might find something else, something slightly lighter touch is established. Kamal, from a journalist's point of view, how hopeful are you that we will find out very much about what's going on in these negotiations? I think there's been a signal from both sides that maybe there will be a little more transparency than initially thought. Michel Barnier, who's going to lead the negotiations for the uh, European Commission, has said that he wants to see a relatively transparent process. So I think there could be some announcements from the European Union about how they want to actually approach um, the trade deal. And I think in the letter today there was some signal about certainty dealing with issues like immigration, dealing with issues about uh, regulation and business relationships with the European Union, which means that there could be some issues of substance sorted and announced before the end of the process. So I think that the conciliatory tone of the letter today does include some notion of greater transparency than maybe we thought. Kamal, thank you very much. Thank you to all of you. Uh, Oliver Eilert from the Institute for Government, uh, Immigration Law, Natasha Chow, and Kamal Ahmed, thank you very much. Thank you to you as well if you sent us some questions, anonymous or otherwise, to BBC Ask This.